Hello, and welcome to this week's Ethical Dilemma in Science, where we're going to take a look at conservation efforts to protect endangered species. Uh, and what they're doing is relocating endangered species into protected regions in an effort to promote species survival. Uh, but the question is, are we disrupting the ecosystems by introducing these animals that are not normally there? Uh, and in essence, are we creating invasive species? Now, one exciting example of attempts to preserve endangered species by relocating them is the effort to move African cheetahs into India, where they've gone in India, where the cheetahs have been locally extinct for almost 70 years. And so eight cheetahs were transported from Namibia uh, in southern Africa in September of 2022, uh, and they were joined by an additional 12 cheetahs uh, in February of 2023. The project to relocate cheetahs into India uh, is facing some challenges. Uh, as of August 2023, nine cheetahs in India have died. So six of the adults that were relocated from southern Africa to India and three cubs that were born in India uh, have died as part of this initiative. And so there are you know, challenges, both scientifically and ethically, to whether or not this should continue, uh, as well as people on the other side saying that these deaths were to be expected. But now we need to take a look at what does it mean if we are going to be relocating these animals to regions where they have not been at least recently located. In order to understand the conservation efforts associated with relocating endangered species, it, it's necessary to really understand what the problem is. And one of the major problems with endangered species and with wildlife in general is that we are seeing habitat fragmentation. We're seeing a reduction in the habitat that is available to these wild species, wild animals, wild plants, uh, all kinds of living organisms. Uh, and then a study in 2021 reported in the Smithsonian Magazine indicates that humans have altered upwards of 97% of Earth's land surface through habitat and species lost. And so in that situation, we're having difficulty uh, maintaining these animals in their natural range because the range is basically disappearing. A concrete example of habitat lost uh, is illustrated in these NASA satellite images of change that's occurred. And so in this case, uh, we're looking at San Antonio, Texas, uh, a satellite image from 1991 here on the left-hand side, where you can see a fair amount of green space, wild space uh, that is maintained. And in a short period of 20 years, from 1991 to 2000, 2010, uh, we've seen kind of massive urban sprawl. All of these kind of whiter areas here are urban development. Um, and so looking at the fact uh, that the world's population has gone from, you know, about a billion people uh, a little over 150 years ago up to 8 billion people now, we're seeing continued growth of human impacted lands. And that is going to impact or reduce the amount of habitat that's available for wild organisms. Further complicating the survival of animals and plants in their natural ranges, in their natural habitats, is the effects that we're seeing with climate change. Uh, and so this is uh, a set of images from the Environmental Protection Agency uh, showing the range of trees from 1960 to 1990 over here on the left hand side and a projected pattern of these trees uh, in about 50 years, 2070 to about 2100. Uh, and what we're seeing here with these trees is also observed with a whole variety of other living organisms in terrestrial environments as they're moving from these warmer climates closer to the equator closer to the pole regions. Uh, and so if we take a look here at, at the red, we're looking at maple uh, and birch trees. Uh, and so up here through a kind of upper kind of mid-Atlantic region, uh, up here into the northeastern states, uh, and they're basically kind of disappearing. Uh, they moved up or migrated up into Canada, uh, where regions down here, where we're looking at, at oak uh, and pine and hickory in the, in the dark to, to light green and 
in this region through here. Uh, we can see that while this is kind of through these kind of Dixie line uh, states right through here, so uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and, and uh, West Virginia and, and Virginia, uh, in the past, uh, we're seeing these extending all the way up into the New England states, up into upper Michigan, uh, as well up here, almost uh, all the way up into Canada. And so we're seeing a poleward migration uh, moving towards the, the poles where the climate is cooler uh, for many of these terrestrial organisms. Uh, we can see the same pattern occurring. There's a study of the European Alps that showed that both plant, animals, and fungi, I guess all three, uh, are moving to higher elevations in response to the increase in temperature at these lower elevations. So moving up to a higher point on the mountains within the Alps to get to a cooler atmosphere. Uh, and the same type of thing is occurring within watery climates uh, as well. Uh, we're seeing migration patterns of fish. Uh, studies in 2021 showing between 20 and 75 percent of fish species are changing at least a portion, a shift of their a shift in their range to a cooler range, to a cooler climate in essence, in the watery uh, environment uh, to get away from the temperatures associated with climate change. So with this migration that we're seeing occurring naturally with organisms moving towards cooler climates, whether it's towards the poles, towards higher elevations, or even in these oceanic uh, uh, waterways, uh, moving to cooler uh, uh, ranges, uh, what we're going to see is a change in what organisms are going to be present within a given region. Uh, and because of that, that could upset the normal ecological balance in place. Now, this is also occurring with the movement of species, either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, as a result of air travel, uh, cargo shipments uh, by boat, uh, kind of moving organisms into locations where they were not normally found. Uh, and they're basically becoming invasive species. Uh, and so in this image, uh, we're looking at uh, water uh, hyacinths uh, in Bangladesh, uh, which had basically kind of choked this waterway. Uh, and so kind of prevented the growth of normal vegetation and disrupted uh, like water in that area. Uh, a study that was published in 2023 uh, indicates that invasive species are estimated, kind of a low estimate uh, according to reading it, uh, at about $423 billion a year, billion with a B, uh, and causing lots of environmental disruption. Uh, and so, you know, within the United States, within the Pennsylvania area, uh, over the last few years, uh, we've seen the stink bugs come out. We've seen uh, the spotted lanternfly. Uh, so lots of different examples of organisms that do not naturally fit within the environment that we're living in that come in and basically wreak devastation uh, on the region, on the ecosystem that is going to be present. So in order to understand the impact that moving species around, either intentionally or unintentionally, through their natural migration or through the, the, the movement of invasive species, is to take a look at their effect on the ecosystem. Uh, and so if we take a look at this in a simple example, uh, basically what we've got here uh, is going to be a food source. Uh, in this case, we're looking at grasses, so uh, plants uh, that are going to be eaten by herbivores, basically plant-eating organisms. In this case, we're looking at deer. Uh, and then ultimately, some predators up here, uh, the predators that would be feeding on the deer. Uh, and normally, what's going to happen, in, in this case, the predators are going to be wolves. Uh, and what normally is going to happen is there's going to be a balance. Uh, the amount of grass or plants that are available, the amount of food that's going to be available is going to determine how many deer are capable of of living and surviving within this region. Uh, the number of uh, wolves, uh, the predators will determine, you know, basically how many uh, of the deer are capable of surviving. And we end up with a, a fairly balanced ecosystem. It may oscillate up and down for any given year or any season, uh, but in general, it's going to be relatively stable without disruption of it by introducing a new species or going in and uh, kind of mankind uh, developing the region for uh, urban expansion or clearing the land uh, for agriculture. If we take a look at the effects within the ecosystem, if we start to disrupt the 
balance of the interactions between the food, uh, the herbivores, the grazers, uh, and the uh, predators, the carnivores, the meat eaters uh, up here at the top. Uh, the first example uh, is taking a look at the loss of food. Uh, and so instead of, you know, four little grass plants uh, growing in uh, this region right through here, uh, we're seeing less grass. And so this could be the result of a drought. Uh, this could be the result of overgrazing. It could be the result of clearing uh, a region uh, for agriculture or to build a highway or to build a, a town or community. Uh, what we're going to see is with the decrease in food available, the decrease in, in grass available, uh, the deer are going to start to die out. Um, this is kind of representing a, a dead deer here. I couldn't find a good image of that. Uh, but then as the deer start to die out, uh, we're going to start to impact uh, the wolf population ultimately with that wolf population dying out uh, because they have nothing to feed on. And so just a simple disruption of the plants in this situation could have a ripple effect on the other interactions within the ecosystem, uh, killing off uh, the deer and ultimately killing off the predators that feed upon the deer. Another example of a disruption of an ecosystem and the balance that is normally found there uh, would be to take a look at the loss of the predators. Uh, and so this is a, a situation that we see in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so we start out with population of deer. We've got a population uh, of grass that's going to be present, uh, but in the absence of predators. And so uh, if we take a look at Pennsylvania, we don't have uh, large predators that are going to be attacking the deer. Uh, and so we've kind of eliminated that kind of force kind of maintaining the population size of the deer. And so this deer are going to start to increase. Uh, without any predators, we're going to get lots of deer surviving and, and reproducing. With this increase in the number of deer, we're going to see a decrease in the amount of grass food that's going to be available because basically these, these, these deer are going to be overgrazing. They're going to be eating more of the plant sources, the food sources, than can be replenished. Uh, and ultimately, we could see kind of a loss of the plants. Uh, and ultimately, we're going to see sick or dead or dying deer uh, present here. Uh, and we observe that in, in the Pennsylvania area. Uh, and so lots of deer dying in the winter, uh, deer being hit by cars um, as they, they try to cross highways. Uh, but in the absence of a predator, uh, we've got a very disrupted uh, ecosystem here. Very unhealthy because the, the plants are not doing well, the deer are not doing well, uh, and you know, we don't have, have any predators to, to worry about in this situation. The flip side of having too few uh, predators would be to have too many predators. Uh, and so in that situation, uh, instead of a one wolf here kind of representing uh, that balanced state that we had initially, uh, we've got more predators going to be present. More predators are going to be better at hunting uh, the the prey population, in this case the grazers, the deer. Uh, and so what we have is that the, the increase in predators, the increase in wolves uh, are going to kill off the deer. Uh, so the deer have all died off at this point. Uh, it's going to be good for the grass because the grass no longer has um, uh, deer grazing on it. Uh, and so the grass is going to grow out, um, basically kind of produce more and more uh, kind of understory uh, in, the, in the forest that we take a look at uh, because we don't have the, deers going, the deer going through uh, and grazing. But that lack of deer then means that we no longer have food for the predators up here. And ultimately, the predators are going to die off. So hopefully what you can see is that disruption of the ecosystem can result in very long lasting and detrimental effects to all of the interactions that are occurring. Uh, and so simply disrupting one level, you know, so uh, affecting the food or affecting the grazers or affecting the carnivores, uh, the, the predators, could have a ripple effect on the ecosystem. Now, recognizing the effect of introducing species into an ecosystem and the ripple effects that can occur, there are examples of returning species to their historic ranges uh, where they've been, you know, 
fairly recently in, in historical times, uh, and then re reestablishing that normal balance. Uh, and so a classic example of this is taking a look at the wolves that were released in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and so the, the wolves were basically uh, hunted to local extinction uh, in the Yellowstone area uh, throughout much of the American West uh, by the, the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, but in the 1990s, there was an effort to bring in Canadian wolves and reintroduce them to the Yellowstone National Park. So if we take a look at the Yellowstone National Park before the wolves were introduced, they had lots of grazers. They had lots of, of elk that would go through and basically eat all the plants. And so because of that, uh, the, the understory, the, the plants and the bushes that would be there uh, were damaged. They were eaten away. Uh, and so the, the animals that would live within those plants no longer had uh, a, a habitat. They no longer had a place to live. Uh, and so we saw a massive decrease in biodiversity as we saw an increase in the elk population. Now, by reintroducing wolves to the Yellowstone National Park, the wolves were able to get the population of elk under control. With the population of elk under control, we were able to see kind of growth of plants, uh, birch trees uh, in the, the creek areas, which allowed for beavers to come back. Beavers cut down the trees, built dams, uh, built little ponds and waterways, uh, and dramatically increased the biodiversity that was present within that area. So in that case, the reintroduction or the return of the wolves to the Yellowstone area uh, will work in progress, but is making good efforts to restore the natural balance to the ecosystem uh, that is present in that region. There are other efforts to reintroduce or introduce uh, species into new domains, into new habitats, in an effort to kind of restore the, the natural ecology that would be present. Uh, in uh, the Russian Arctic, uh, normally they would have large herbivores, large grazers uh, like the woolly mammoths that would be involved in, in turning over the soil and in producing uh, fecal matter, uh, poop, uh, that would serve to nourish the, the soil, that would serve uh, to nourish the, the growth of plants. Uh, and with the woolly mammoths being extinct, uh, they're seeing a disruption in that, again, natural balance within the ecosystem. And the idea is that we take another large grazer, another large herbivore like the, the bison here, we can introduce this to the Russian Arctic and that would help restore that natural balance within the ecosystem. So now we get to the ethical dilemma in science for this week, where we ask the question, should we be relocating and making endangered species into invasive species uh, in order to save them? Do we need to move these animals to a location where they can be protected, um, but a new region, a new habitat where they were not normally found? If we were to do that, what organisms should be relocated? Uh, are we only going to worry about the, the big charismatic uh, animals that we can, we can see and uh, tourists are going to be attracted to come visit and, and take pictures of? Or should we be worried about uh, the plants and the, the smaller animals as well? Uh, what consideration should be given to, to native species that are already in the area? Uh, if we're going to induce a new species that is potentially going to be invasive, what is the impact that that is going to have on the native species there? Uh, and then finally, looking at the challenges faced by the cheetah project in India, are cheetahs in India an example of an invasive species that is struggling uh, rather than flourishing? Uh, they're African uh, cheetahs moved into India, uh, different climate, uh, different uh, pattern of seasons. It still has the seasons, uh, but the, the southern hemisphere uh, is going to be different from the seasons in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and so the, the cats, which may have had you know, more of a fur coat uh, in the African winter, uh, are now having that fur coat during the Indian summer and potentially overheating. Uh, and so these are questions that we need to ask uh, because we want to protect these endangered species and it's becoming very clear that we may not be able to 
maintain these species in their natural habitat as humanity continues to grow out and cause habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, as climate change occurs and we're seeing disruption in the, the normal ecosystem that's going to be available, we're seeing mi movement of, of animals to cooler climates. All of this is occurring at a time where we're trying to protect these endangered species. So should we be relocating these endangered species in order to save them? Thank you for listening to this week's Ethical Dilemma in Science. Uh, please see the description below for additional information and references. Thank you and have a great week.